Right, so it is day 96 of my resolution to plant a tree every day for 2023. And this behind me is a grapefruit tree. Um, and I want you to take particular note, uh, if we can find one that's actually at the right level, of the form of its leaves. Okay, and now let's get on with it. Right, so you probably guessed from that little introduction that we are doing something related to grapefruit. And today we are doing a pomelo, which is actually a sort of wild ancestor of the grapefruit. One of the wild ancestors, because most domestic citrus that you will encounter are crosses and back crosses and crosses and back crosses over and over again until you will genuinely lose, you, lose your mind. I'm not entirely sure who the other ancestor of grapefruit is, but it was crossed with a pomelo to produce the bitter round fruit we all know and, should we say, love. So that makes me want to talk about apples, weirdly enough, because apples are part of the reason that we're so scared of planting seeds, because with uh, your average, say, kumquat or lime or lemon, most of the time you're looking at a maternal copy and a paternal copy of each chromosome. Uh, so very much as, as in humans, you inherit one set of chromosomes from your mother and one set from your father, and they come together and you have a double set and you use the ones you need from each side, and sometimes there's a little bit of uh, DNA methylation to, to decide you must use the paternal version for this or you must use the maternal version for that. But generally speaking, it's quite nice and straightforward. One maternal, one paternal, and then it passes on. Uh, most fruit trees do the same. Apples decided to go extra. So at some point around domestication, I'm not sure if it was pre or post domestication, but I assume it was pre, apples duplicated their genome. So each apple in inherits two sets of chromosomes from each parent. And that means they have a much wider variety of genes within their genome. They have four copies of any given gene, and any of those could end up being the one that's expressed. And you don't know which ones are dominant in the parent very often, and it's a lot harder to work out than sort of standard Mendelian genetic. You're probably taught in high school with little boxy things to work out how many children would be A and B and capital A and capital B and so forth. And that is not going to be nearly so simple with apples. There's going to be much wider variation between the same sort of set of parents, how many different versions of offspring they can produce. And very often, because it's so wild and so unpredictable, you'll take two very nice apple varieties, cross them, and get a crab apple, one that is good for very little except cider, and that's only if you're lucky. And so that is why apples, for example, are usually grafted rather than grown from seed. And you might be grafting them onto something that is grown from seed, usually some type of crab apple, although very often that will be reproduced carefully to get the right sort of rootstock, dwarfing types, and so forth. Pomelos, you don't really need to do that because they will grow from seed usually as a recognizable pomelo, and also they are one of the relatively few citrus which is quite easy to grow from cutting without grafting, which does make it a little bit peculiar that this one does seem to be grafted onto a rough lemon base. So back to pomelos briefly, they are a large citrus, they are actually the largest citrus as far as I'm aware, um, and it is a little bit perplexing, but I suspect that is the best reason that they are not as favored as grapefruit, because they are much milder flavoured than grapefruit. It's a similar flavour overall, but without that distinctive bitterness you usually get in grapefruits. Um, and it's very fresh and very pleasant. You can use it much more broadly without it give, giving that very powerful grapefruit flavour. You can actually chop the, the rind up and use that to thicken jams and to flavour cakes and so forth without it overwhelming them like grapefruit flavour usually does. Um, but again, it is a much larger fruit. It's also a more tropical tree. Grapefruits are more cold hardy than, than pomelos generally, which again probably explains why grapefruit is more widely grown in the temperate regions of the world. It is going in with a Dracaena fragrance, a Canalo Cameroni, and a Calanco Fetchenkoi. By now I think those have been explained to death. Um, and so yeah, so that should be everything for today. Thank you very much for watching. Um, apologies if it was a little bit of a sort of out of left field ramble again, uh, but I hope it was at least a little bit informative and please tune in again tomorrow if you did enjoy it and feel free not to if you didn't. Right, so this little guy is a toad, and toads are not quite the most, but one of the frog groups that I would say are almost qualifying for the sort of Darwinian demon status. They are incredibly environmentally tolerant. They, they will not, I have discovered, tolerate chickens nearly as well as some of the other frogs. But they are very, very good at surviving the sort of general pollution, the general sort of build-up of chaos and destruction that happens around cities as, as the city has come out to where we are. Uh, more and more of our frogs have got rarer and rarer, but toads are one that genuinely have thrived. And we 
do tend to have three species, uh, although two of them have become significantly less common in recent years. Um, the red toad has been much more common, mostly because it seems to be better at surviving the chickens. Um, but they are, because they have quite thick skin, they're quite chemically resistant, but they're also quite good at learning to come to lights uh, and basically hunt insects that come to those lights. And even on occasion, toads have been recorded moving in under people's cupboards and coming out at night to eat their cockroaches. They're fantastic little creatures. And if there is a drawback at all, it's that they are themselves quite often targeted by some of our snakes, including, you know, some of the relatively modest ones like the night adders, which aren't particularly venomous, uh, but also things that are quite significantly venomous, things like the uh, spitting cobras and the snouted cobras, which are snakes I have no interest in ever stepping on, um, although they are beautiful snakes and, generally speaking, very well behaved when you do encounter them. But yeah, so that should be a very young flat-backed toad for you.